I'm going to lighten things up just a little bit now. Not much, but this is what my mama taught me too. Little boy in a baseball hat stands in the field with his ball and bat. He says, I am the greatest player of them all. Puts his bat in his shoulder and he tosses up the ball. And the ball goes up and the ball comes down. Swings his bat all the way around. The world's so still you can hear the sound. The baseball falls to the ground. Now the little boy... He doesn't say a word, he picks up his ball, he is undeterred. He says, I am the greatest there has ever been. And he grits his teeth and he tries again. And the ball goes up and the ball comes down. The world's so still you can hear the sound. The ball comes down. To the ground. <laughs> he makes no excuses. He shows no fear. He just closes his eyes and listens to the cheers. Little boy, he adjusts his hat, picks up his ball, stares at his bat. He says, I am the greatest. When the game is on the line and he gives his all just one last time. And the ball goes up and the moon so bright swings his back with all his might. The world's as still as still can be. The baseball falls. And that's strike three. Now it's supper time. And his mama calls, little boy starts home with his bat and his ball. He says, I am the greatest, that is a fact. But even I didn't know I could pitch like that. <laughs> I am the greatest, that is understood. But even I didn't know I could pitch that. Good. That's my mom. Yeah. That's my mom who says when you when you give it your all, it's all attitude. When the world really offers you lemons and you can make lemonade out of it. When Paul's in the Mamertine prison in Rome, the most horrible place on earth to be. And he can write the greatest book on joy. And he says in chapter 3, after all Ron read about his life and all he had been through, he says that I may know you. I just want to know Jesus. I'm trying, Lord. I'm trying. That I may know him. I jotted down some notes of things. By the way, in the Bible, there are at least four great moms that we know about. We know about Hannah, how she was barren and she prayed and God blessed her with who? Samuel. We know about a lady named, oh, how about Sarah? Sarah couldn't have a baby. And at age 90, God opens her womb and blesses her with a guy named Isaac, a patriarch of the Jewish nation. How about Elizabeth in the New Testament? She couldn't have a baby either. And at an old age, God opens her womb and John the Baptist is born. And possibly the greatest mom of all. Should have, could have, would have been stoned outside the city. Age 14. No more ready to be a mother than the... If there, if there were abortions back in Jerusalem, maybe this lady... No, she wouldn't have even thought of no. it. Her name is Mary. The mother of Jesus. 14. Unmarried. And an angel had to go to Joseph and say, hey, it's okay. It's okay. The baby that's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, Joseph. Take her as your wife. I sometimes wonder who the greatest 
who went through the greatest stress and turmoil. Was it Mary having a baby? And she knew she never touched a man. She knew that. Or was it Joseph who had, was engaged to a lady who became pregnant on her? Men, what would you think? Mary goes to Joseph, it's okay, Joseph. See, see, I never touched a man, and what's inside of me is a miracle. Yeah, yeah. All right. Joseph needed some divine revelation, didn't he? Mary did too. And Mary ends up saying, be it unto me according to your will. A six-year-old boy was separated from his mom in the supermarket. Any of you, when you were little, you separated from your mom? This little boy had his act together, though. He started running through the, from, through the aisle saying, Martha, Martha, Martha. And his mother came running around the corner and said, and he, she held him and hugged him. And, and she said, honey, why did you use my name? Why didn't you just call out mommy? And the little boy said, Mom, do you have any idea how many mothers are in this, in this grocery store? <laughs> they all would have come running. That's intelligence. You can tell you've been a mom through three or four different things I jotted down. You automatically double nod everything you tie. You know you're a mom when you do that. You find yourself humming the Barney song as you wash dishes. You actually start to like the smell of strained carrots mixed with applesauce. You've had too many kids. You spend a half hour searching for your sunglasses, only to have your teenage daughter come and say, Mom, why don't you just wear the ones you pushed up on your head? Or you're out for a nice romantic meal. Ladies, I'll bet some of you have done that. You're out for a nice romantic meal with your husband, enjoying some real adult conversation, when suddenly you realize you reached over and started cutting your husband's steak for him. <laughs> Mamas do that, you know. You know your mom if you do things like that. But my mom taught me a lot of good stuff. And your moms have too. Let me give you some examples, and we'll get to the message in a minute. My mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. My mom would say, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning the living room. She taught me about religion. You better pray that, that stain comes out of that carpet. She taught, taught, taught me about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle, middle ages. My mom taught me logic. Because I said so, that's why. Amen. We need more days like that. I've seen mothers actually try to debate a, a maternal decision with a three-year-old. It's because I said so. That's why. Period. There is no more discussion or debate. We live in a crazy society today. People of God, they've lost their mind. Common sense has left the building. The SJW, social justice women. No, no. Warriors, social justice. They think that's, that social justice is divine justice. And it's not. Divine justice is coming. By the way, if you're keeping, I told the men in prayer this morning, next week is a full red blood moon. It's also the 70th week of Shemitah, the end of Shemitah, the entering in of the year of Jubilee. What does that mean to us? At the end of the Shemitah, the seven-year tribulation is supposed to begin. So there are many, 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 many Bible scholars <laughs> out there not setting a date, not setting a time, but it's just saying, you might want to be ready. Because his return is very, very near. I told you one of my friend preachers said, it's looking really good because it's looking really bad. <laughs> it's true. It's looking really good for the Christians. I hope you're a Christian today. I hope you know Jesus. I hope he knows you. 
And I don't mean in a God way. I mean God knows everything. He's omniscient. But I pray he knows you as his child. Because God doesn't have grandkids. You're either his child or you're not. My mom taught me about the science of osmosis. Shut your mouth and eat your supper. <laughs> Can you do that? How can you shut your mouth and eat your supper? Only a mother would say that. My mom told me about stamina. You're going to sit there until all that spinach is gone. Oh, that was horrible. Kids, did you have to sit through that? My worst was those little cabbage things. What are those things called? Oh, Brussels sprouts. They've got to eat that stuff in hell for eternity. <laughs> Brussels sprouts, it's the worst vegetable ever created. See, Sarah's agreeing with me. It's <laughs> deplorable. And I'll bet there are people right here that really love it, don't you? It's not. Thank you, David. It's horrible. <laughs> My mother taught me about weather. This room of yours looks like a tornado just went through it. It's so true. My mom taught me about the circle of life. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> My mom even taught me about behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. I don't think I heard that one too much. My mom taught me about anticipation. Just you wait until I get you home. <laughs> My mother taught me about receiving. You're going to get it. When I get you home. Medical science. If you don't, if you don't stop crossing your eyes, the wind will change and you will be a, you'll turn into a statue like that. I don't know how many times she told that to me. And my mom taught me about how to become an adult. If you don't eat your vegetables, you'll never grow up. Yeah. The power of a mom. But one of the greatest things my mom taught me, there's three great things, I won't keep you long on these. My mom taught me how to love. And involved in loving is caring. My mom taught me about character. She said the definition of character is what you do when no one else is around. Amen. If you think no one else will find out, that's character. What are you going to do then? By the way, you're deceived if you think you can do anything without being found out by a holy God. In the book of Numbers, we're told, and don't forget this, behold, your sin will find you out. It's not if, it's just when. Can't fool God, can't hide from Him. No matter where you go, He's there. He knows where you're at. He knows what you're doing. He even knows what you're thinking. Wow. I know some of you can't wait to get out of here. It's getting a little bit warm, isn't it? My mom taught me how to treat ladies with dignity, respect, honor. My mom taught me that if I'm sitting on a bus and a lady walks in and she has to stand to give up my seat for her. How often do you see that happening today? Not too often. Last time I did that, I was working for Continental Airlines. We had to ride a bus from the, the employee parking lot into the terminal, FAA regulations. So I'm sitting in my seat, got the last seat, and all of a sudden there's one more stop and two flight attendants get on. So I'm a ramp rat. I've got my coveralls on. I'm ready to load airplanes all day. And I stood up for either one of the ladies and the first flight attendant slapped me across my face and she said, you think I'm too weak to stand up? I said, no, I just think you're too ugly. <laughs> I didn't say that. You know me better than that. But another female ramp rat grabbed my coveralls and said, sit down. Let her stand up. She deserves to stand up. She's not a lady. Wow. A female defending me against a female. We've come a long way in this country. We have kids running away from home. We have kids doing things that, that, that are incredibly sad because they lost hope somewhere along the way. You lose hope 
and the next day is tough. You lose hope and food doesn't taste good anymore. You lose hope and it's hard to sleep at night. A lot of our young people have lost hope. They see all this craziness, all this evil becoming good and good becoming evil and they're confused. They've lost hope. My mom taught me how to work. How about you? She taught me how to go in the backyard on a hot, humid Pennsylvania afternoon and mow the lawn with one of those push mowers. Not the powerized push mower, the old blades that went around. And she made... Do you do that too? See? I like you. I remember it would take little old me, a nine-year-old boy, maybe two or three hours to do our backyard. And every once in a while, Mom would come out with some lemonade. She said, Bobby, come take a break. And I was always praying, Lord, give her a sensitive heart, saying that's good enough for the day, son. But she never did that. She said, let's finish Amen. what you started. She taught me the value of hard work. If you have your Bibles, turn to Jeremiah chapter 6, please. Jeremiah chapter 6. And put your finger there and turn back one page before that to Jeremiah chapter 5. The verse I want to share with you is in chapter 6, verse number 16. But to build up to that, I want to share these two verses. Chapter 5, verse 23. But this people has a revolting and rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. This nation called America has a rebellious and a revolting heart, a revolting spirit. America has revolted and is spiritually going. I'm not going to say we're gone yet, because we serve a powerful God. I preached on the last great awakening a couple Sundays ago. The last great awakening. And with all my heart, and with all my strength, and with all my prayers, and with all my might, I'm begging God for a last great awakening in our country before His return. Will we see one? It's not too hard for God. But what has to be required? God's people need it. They must want it. They must want it. God's ready. He's ready to pour out a great movement of the, His Holy Spirit on this place. From east to west, from north to south, God wants to do it. Will He find ten righteous people in this nation that want it? Well, Pastor, what do you got to do to want it? What does that mean? Can I tell you real quick? It means to be humble and broken in your own spirit and say, Father, the Gethsemane prayer, not my will anymore, but yours be done. Does the church want that? In most churches, the answer is no. It's too much to give up. I've got to give up way too much for that. I have to be, I might have to be more faithful in church. I might have to help. I might have to do this. I talked about singing hymns and so many churches, they've abolished it. That's the old way. That's the, the that's the, um, the, the mule driving the cart days. We live in the space age, baby. We are high tech. We've got everything. We've got monitors. We've got sound systems. We've got all of that except revival. Except the power of his presence. Except the brokenness of being in his presence. I could hardly get through these songs today. Because my heart and soul was so stirred to hear you sing songs that do bring conviction. Songs they used to sing in great awakenings and in revivals. I've never heard in the last 20 years of revival breaking out because of the new music. Hasn't happened, and it won't. 
There's no conviction. Sometimes we sing the songs we don't even know who we're singing to, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or Jesus. It's so ambiguous you don't know. You just don't know. Which leads me to chapter 6 and verse 16. This is the Lord talking, by the way. Thus saith the Lord. I want you to stand in the way and look and see and ask for the old paths. Those old paths are the paths our mamas taught us. Those old paths are the ones where right is right and wrong is wrong. Left is left and right is right. Those are the old paths. It was common sense. It made sense. Ask for the old paths. Where is that good way? And walk in it. And there you will find rest for your souls. But the people said, we're not going to walk there. Those days are over. We're not going there. That's America. This book was written 600 years before Jesus was born. And it's like reading today's headlines. We're not going to walk there. We refuse. So God's looking down on a church, on a church, and he's asking his children, do you want to enjoy the power of my resurrection? Do you want to, want to enjoy my presence, my power, my convicting Holy Spirit power? Do you want that? Do you want to walk with Jesus in the fellowship of his suffering? It's coming, by the way. Church, it's coming, ready or not. Persecution is on the way. It's already started. But so many churches are asleep, we don't even realize it. Persecution is here. The fellowship of his suffering, the power of of his resurrection and being made like unto his death, conformed to his death. Jesus told his disciples, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. Unless you try to live a double life and have a double standard, then maybe you can sneak past the world, but you can't sneak past me. <coughs> so, Pastor Bob, what are you saying today? Just this thought. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, moms. Thank you, grandmas. Thank you, great grandmas, for showing us what love is all about. That's the greatest thing my mom taught me. She even warned me. She did. She said, Bobby, I can see trouble for you down the road because you always wear your emotions on your sleeve. You're going to have your heart broken. She was right. She was right. Moms are right. I had, to con I had to concede that. I could fool my dad sometimes, could never fool my mom. Why? Because she loves with her whole heart. An epitaph on his wife's tombstone, written by her husband, after 60 years of their marriage, read, she always made home happy. That's the love of a mother. That's the love of a wife. The final thought about our moms, how great they are, how much they love, how much they've sacrificed, how much they've given away. A teacher was asking Johnny in math class, Johnny, I have a cherry pie here and there's 10 people in your family. Let's say there's eight kids and mom and dad. How much of that pie will you get? And he said, I'll get a ninth. No, no, Johnny, you didn't understand. There's ten slices and there's ten people, so how much will you get? And he said, I'll get a ninth. Because I know my mama, she'll just say, no, thank you, I don't want one. That's what mamas do. They sacrifice. Even at childbirth, they sacrifice.
parents, willing to surrender their life for the birth of their baby. That's love. Don't you think? I'm going to preach on the Heavenly Father on Father's Day. But I thank God for Heavenly Mothers this morning. I thank God for Heavenly Ladies. Proverbs 31 women. If you're in love with a Proverbs 31 woman, you've got it made. You are so blessed. I want a Proverbs 31 wife. I'm looking everywhere. Been to the bars, been to the clubs. Can't find one yet. I'm just kidding. It's going to happen maybe sooner than, sooner than you all know. Now you wake up. Now you start smiling. You guys. Thomas Edison once said, I'm going to finish after this. I did not have my mother long, Thomas Edison said. But she cast over me an influence which has lasted my life. Amen, men? Amen, ladies? Amen. Our mama did that. The good effects of her early training I can never lose. If it had not been for her appreciation and her faith in me at a critical time in my experience, I should never likely have become an inventor. I was always a careless boy and with a mother of different mental caliber. In other words, I was smarter than mom. I should have turned out badly, but her firmness, her sweetness, her goodness, her love for me were the potent powers to keep me on the right path. My mother was the making of me. The memory of her will always be a blessing to me. I pray that we, as I close in Proverbs 31, 28, this morning, right where you're at, right where you're sitting, you can do this. Proverbs 31, 28. Thank you for teaching us the old paths, ladies. Thank you for teaching us the right way. Thank you for teaching us the way to walk, the straight paths for our feet to keep us away from trouble and harm. Thank you. You have, you have no idea how precious you are for doing that. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Men, if your mom is not around anymore, she's gone, she's passed. I know the feeling. I wish my mama was here still. I wish I could call her on the phone and just praise her. I tried to do that this morning in my humble way. But my mom is gone. But maybe there's someone else for you if your mom is not around either. She's called a wife. And men, maybe it's time that we learn to be a little bit more sensitive and hover more. Right, ladies? That's an amen time. Amen. amen. Maybe it's time to call her blessed. Maybe it's time to praise her. Maybe it's time to say, honey, you sit down. You sit down and I'll get the kids to clean up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Men, maybe it's time. I really mean this with all my heart. I wish my mama were still here. I'd love to go to Pennsylvania and give her a great big squinch. She called them squinches. I think it's a Pennsylvania word. I don't know. But I'd love to give my mom hugs. I wish I could give her one more hug. I wish I could look into her eyes one more time and say, thank you, Mom. Thank you for teaching me about attitude, about never giving up, about never quitting. My mom, she said, Bobby, you're going to be a great one, whatever you do. And one day, it was the first day of Little League, we got our uniforms, and they went by sizes. 
And so the smallest were the smaller numbers and up to number 15 or 16 for the bigger boys. I always got the smallest uniform, could never figure that out. And I came home with a number one on my back. Not because I thought I was number one, that was just the smallest uniform, the smallest size. And she said, Bobby, I want you to take this jersey back and I want you to request number two. Ask for number two. I said, why, Mom? This fits so good. I didn't get it for the number. I got it for the size. She said, I know that. But I want you to know there's always going to be somebody better than you. And I want you to never stop trying. I don't want you to ever think that you have arrived. Keep trying. Stay number two. And then she added this. And how can I argue with this? Let Jesus be your number one. Is Jesus your number one today? That's just between you and the Lord. That, are you, that's not a, yeah, or no, I don't want to hear any, see any hands. Is Jesus your number one? I pray that he is. If he's not, maybe we can surrender that place. And whatever's taking his spot, set it aside and say, Jesus, my, the throne of my heart belongs to you. Knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus. Amen, church.